Right, okay, good morning everyone. Um, great to have you with us uh, today. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time uh, out of your busy schedules to be, to be here. My name is James Wilmot from uh, Forum Global and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, here today to this fourth annual uh, US Data Privacy Conference, uh, which is taking place um, in person for the first time in, in, a, in a couple of years. Uh, we have, uh, as you uh, will be aware, held uh, two of the most recent editions online uh, and while those were superbly attended and um, extre uh, with extremely senior participation, um, it's great to be back in person, as I'm sure you'll all agree. So um, I feel like clapping at that point, to be honest. But, uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> um, so it's uh, my job to be brief. I'll hand over to Dan uh, from the uh, Providence Group. Um, and I'll take the opportunity now, in fact, to say uh, thanks to you, Dan, um, and also to Jonathan uh, from the Providence Group. Um, for your long-standing support of this conference and uh, some of the activities here in the US uh, and in Europe. Uh, so thanks, and we'll see Jonathan a little bit later as well, because he'll be moderating a session uh, this afternoon. Uh, so as you know, this event is taking place against the backdrop of um, an acceleration in regulatory discussions and initiatives around uh, data privacy in the US with the advancements of the um, ADPPA to the House floor, the passage of the COPPA uh, II and COSA, in the Senate Commerce Committee, uh, and potentially some new rules as well around commercial surveillance and, uh, and data security by the FTC, uh, amongst uh, other initiatives. Uh, so there's a lot to get through uh, today, uh, and we're really uh, looking forward to getting started. One uh, small point of adjustment, uh, maybe not so small, I wanted to make you aware of is that Congresswoman uh, McMorris Rogers is not able to join us again, uh, today, unfortunately, so that news came in uh, quite recently. A big thank you to our uh, conference sponsors, uh, without whom uh, this wouldn't be possible. So in alphabetical order, um, uh, ACT, the App Association, uh, BSA, the Software Alliance, uh, ITI, Microsoft, Workday, uh, and AT&T. Um, thank you for your support, very much appreciated. The, the Wi-Fi details, oh, they're in the top, uh, top corner there. Uh, you should be able to see them. Um, it's event route to six and event 0922. Uh, you can tweet by using the hashtag uh, DataUSA22. Um, and we also want to get you involved in the discussions as much as possible. So uh, the moderators for each of the sessions at the appropriate time um, uh, will open up for Q&A and we'll have microphones, uh, microphones going around. Um, one commercial message, one final point, uh, is that as many of you know, we run uh, one of the biggest um, European data privacy conferences in, in Europe as well. Um, and we've just announced the date for that, which will be the 1st of uh, December. Commissioner Reinders has already confirmed the keynote for that. So if anyone's interested, if, you don't, if you're not really on our mailing list, then we can make you aware of that if you're interested in what's going on in, in Europe. Um, if you need anything at all throughout the day, you can speak to myself, my colleague Annalise, uh, or Lorena. We'll do our very best to help you. Um, and with that, uh, wish you a great day, and I'll hand over to Dan uh, Caprio. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, James, and uh, thank you for that uh, the, the kind introduction. I'm uh, Dan Caprio, co-founder of the Providence Group here in Washington, D.C., and it's a privilege. We've, we've worked as a, a partner with uh, Forum Global and Forum Europe in Brussels for a number of years now. So it's a it's it's a privilege and an honor uh, to continue that relationship and to have this kickoff panel on um, on data privacy. Um, so I thought just real quickly because there's there's a lot going on in privacy. Mm -hmm just to, to frame this a little bit of sort of how did we get here. Uh, we've got a very distinguished uh, panel. Uh, we've got a lot of ground um, to cover. Um, and so, you know, for, for, for those of you that are in, in the space, and, and I should also say, echo James's comment, it's so nice to see everybody in person. Uh, it's just a relief not to be, you know, behind a, a screen. And so when we, when, and we look forward to you know, a, an interaction among the panel and obviously an interaction uh, with you all, so we want to have save some time for, for Q&A. So how did we get here? Um, we, this, we, we've been, you know, working on federal privacy legislation or thinking about it for, you know, a good solid 20, 25 years. But it really, the, the privacy discussions really began to accelerate in, in 2018 
where there was initially a ballot initiative in California uh, related to privacy. That, uh, at the very last minute, turned into, it moved from a ballot initiative, which are very difficult to amend, to the legislative process uh, that passed you know, very quickly without a whole lot of, of uh, stakeholder input uh, that then led to a second ballot initiative. Um, there are other states that have, have, and I think the thinking in Washington was, well, everyone's going to adopt. You know, California will set the standard and, and everyone will, the states will adopt laws that, that are similar to California. That's not what's happened. And we have a number of states, uh, Colorado, Virginia, Connecticut, that have passed uh, uh, privacy laws that with, a, with a little more uh, stakeholder input that I think are a little more uh, balanced. But California still you know, sits out there um, uh, by itself. But that led to you know, an ongoing uh, discussion, which is, as I said, been happening for 20 plus years, that led to the introduction of the ADPPA, uh, the three-corner bill, with the chairman of the, or the ranking, ranking member of the Senate Commerce Committee and the, the chair and ranking member of, of the House Commerce Committee. Uh, I should also say that uh, I was talking to uh, Representative McMor McMorris Rogers' office yesterday. There's a, a markup. She really wanted to be here and sends her uh, regrets um, because she's really been a leader and a, a champion on this. But, you know, there's been a series of hearings in the House Commerce Committee. Um, the, the ADPPA has advanced, it's, it's made it further than any bill. Um, to date, a strong bipartisan vote uh, out of the Commerce Committee awaiting uh, floor action uh, in, the, um, in the House. And then that, that, that leads to uh, the Federal Trade Commission. So the Federal Trade Commission has been active in, you know, in privacy for the last 25, 30 years under its existing uh, Section 5 authority. And the, the FTC announced uh, an announced notice of public rulemaking, rulemaking an ANPR, uh, back in August. They had a, an event, uh, which Ronnie's going to speak to, uh, on um, uh, September 8th, uh, sort of hearing from, from um, um, uh, witnesses. There was the, the ANPR is very broad. Uh, Public is 95 questions, and for those of you that are interested, uh, comments on that are due by October 21st. So the, the 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 conversation the FTC had last week, I think there's 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 no uh, dispute that that there was a, a consensus that we need uh, uh, we need privacy regulation. There's some difference of opinion as to whether or not it needs to be an FTC rule or uh, 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 you know, passed by Congress. I know there's a sharp division among the commissioners at the at the FTC. Um, you know, the, the the majority commissioners supported issuing the rule. Um, the minority commissioners, commissioners Wilson and Phillips, both dissented for slightly different reasons. But um, um, it's it's you know the FTC is is marching ahead. Um, there was a just very quickly, there was a, a, I think, a real strong discussion at the at the FTC event of the distinction between first and third party cookies. There was a robust discussion about limits of informed consent. Uh, there was a discussion about uh, uh, global opt out, and then there was, as was discussed yesterday, <laughs> at the the Judiciary Committee hearing the implications um, for, for national security. And I know one of our panelists, uh, Paul Martino. Uh, uh, testified at the at the uh, at the event, and so we can we can hear from him. Um, so the 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 format for these uh, forum global events is we, we allow we ask each of our speakers to to do opening comments of about uh, three minutes, and then we'll have a discussion among ourselves, and then we'll bring you in uh, to it. So our our first speaker is is uh, Ronnie Solomon who's an attorney at the, uh, at, in the Division of Privacy and Internet Protection at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, we have uh, Sarah Collins, who's a Senior Policy Counsel, uh, Public Knowledge. 
uh, uh, Shane Tooze, who's a non-resident uh, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, Lords uh, Terecha, who's founder and chief privacy tech evangelist, which is the rise of privacy tech, and Lords, uh, I just admire anyone who has evangelist in their title, so <laughs> that's awesome. And then last, certainly not least, uh, Paul Martino, who is vice president and senior policy counsel at the National Retail Federation. So let's, uh, Ronnie, let's start with you and uh, sure. we'll kick it off. Great. Well, thank you all for being here this morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you in person. Again, my name is Ronnie Solomon, and I'm an attorney at the Federal Trade Commission within the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. And just want to make a disclaimer before I start my remarks. Um, uh, my, everything I say here today represents my own views and does not represent the views of any uh, individual commissioner or the commission. Um, so I'm, I do privacy work at the FTC, Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. Uh, my work focuses on litigation and investigations. I've been with the Federal Trade Commission for about five and a half years. Prior to that, I was in private practice at Fenwick and West in Silicon Valley and San Francisco. Um, I'd like to provide, I want to talk a few minutes about what the FTC is. I'm sure many of you are familiar, but I wanted to give a little bit of a primer of what the FTC is, what we do, and a little bit about our enforcement authority. Uh, we do three main things at the FTC. First, our bread and butter is enforcement. We do policy, and we do consumer and business education. It's so kind of starting with enforcement, again, our bread and butter. Um, we bring enforcement actions against companies that violate our statute, which prohibits unfair and deceptive business practices. So. Uh, what does that mean in the context of privacy and data security, unfair and deceptive business practices? So, for example, a deceptive practice in the context of privacy could be deceiving consumers about how you collect, share, and maintain personal data. Uh, one recent example, we brought an a enforcement action about a year ago against a company called Flow Health. We sued them for deceiving consumers about uh, who they were sharing sensitive personal health information with. Um, another example where a company fails to implement reasonable security measures uh, to protect personal data from being exposed, think of a data breach, uh, we think of that as an unfair business practice and could bring an enforcement action in that context. Um, in addition to our main statute, we have specific rules that we enforce in specific industries. So think about the health breach notification rule involving breaches of sensitive health information, uh, the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, which, in, which relates to financial information, uh, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, again, Children's Online Privacy, um, you know, Fair Credit Reporting Act, what have you. Um, we also have some authority to create broader rules, um, which we'll talk a little bit about today. So that's, um, that's a little bit about our enforcement. If we suspect there's a violation of the law, we may send the company a CID. We may request documents, information, testimony, uh, which may or may not lead to a, a complaint could result in a settlement or um, uh, litigation in terms of a lawsuit in federal or administrative court. Uh, in terms of our policy, we do, um, we publish papers, we host a privacy conference called PrivacyCon every year, where we have um, speakers who present on cutting edge research. And then just in terms of um, consumer and business education, um, we publish pieces um, uh, to educate consumers and businesses on best practices, and I would encourage everyone here, if you haven't already done so, to check out our website and um, take a look at some of our, um, specifically our business guidance. Um, thank you all, and I'll, I'll pause there to turn it over to my colleague. Hi. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Sarah Collins, Senior Policy Counsel at Public Knowledge. While um, Public knowledge is focused broadly on tech and telecom issues, including competi competition, free expression, open access to the internet. I'm here today to talk to you about privacy. Um, so our organization has a focus on the public interest. So when I approach data privacy, whether it's legislation, proposed regulations, et cetera, I am first and foremost thinking about how this best serves the public and consumers. So some of my priors include that the current regime is not working right now. It's based on notice and choice, and that is just not tenable for consumers. It predisposes that consumers have the ability to completely understand all the different business models that they may be, may be thrown against and the interrelations of how data gets moved about the internet and in other spaces, and that's, as it's been shown over the past 20 years, basically impossible. So if this regime isn't working, what does the new regime or what does the proposed 
uh, regime that we think should look like. So it's based, generally speaking, on two principles, uh, data minimization and purpose specification. And to be glib about it, don't collect data, any data that you need, and don't use it for things people can't predict. Um, we'll get into what this means as the panel goes forward, but I think it's useful to know where I'm coming from this. Um, and the reason for this is we think it best centers like consumer rights and prevents consumer harms. Um, and through this, we've taken a lot of learnings and knowledge from researchers, um, advocacy orgs in the civil rights community, in uh, the gender violence communities, and others about how data can be weaponized. And so this, these learnings from other disciplines we think should really inform how the process moves forward. So I'm excited to get into all of this with you, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Shane. Good morning. It is really exciting to be in a room full of people. And the other thing is I've realized that my pens um, have been dwelling. And I've, I've been going to conferences lately. And it's so exciting to get a, <laughs> <laughs> office equipment again. Um, so I wrote a piece. I, I've been doing privacy for probably 25 years, like a lot of people, especially with Dan and Paul. So we, we have um, been doing this for quite a while. I wrote a piece on um, April 5th for the American Enterprise Institute titled, It's Time for a Federal Privacy Law That Works in Today's Digital Ecosystem. And what, uh, what gave me the catalyst to write that was actually the work of Kathy McMorris Rogers, who is very sad she's not here today. And her colleagues, um, Roger Wicker on the Senate side and Frank Pallone uh, as well, her um, counterpart in the House, the, the person missing there is Maria Cantwell. And they did a lot of work to get to the stage where they are now. This has been a very tough discussion for a long time uh, because we, there were a lot of groups that didn't want to see a federal privacy law. I, can't, I don't think of it as privacy. I think of it as data protection because it's easier to understand from a legal perspective what you can protect for data. But I will use the phrase privacy because it's, it's the nomenclature. Uh, so the two main things that they really struggled with and I think came to a, a good compromise is the challenge of the private right of action. Uh, and they originally had, a f I believe, four years in to, uh, to allow companies to change their practices and, and put an ability for remedies in place. And, and with working with Campbell's office, they, they downsize that to two years, saying, okay, all right, you're saying two, four years is too long, she still won't come to the table. So the other um, entity is uh, preemption, which is a tough one, especially when you are in a state legislature and you feel like you've put a lot of work into your state's bill, and then you feel like the federal government's going to just fly above you and erase all the work you just did. But I think that part of the challenge now is that, um, to the, you know, sort of the title to my piece, we're in an ecosystem now that is global. And even if you don't travel globally, it definitely, a lot of you probably crossed a bridge today or you came over um, away from, you know, you were either, you may not have started in the District of Columbia. If you have to manage all of those different states' capabilities on what most of our lives are now on as digital devices, that becomes very tricky. So I think that part of why we need to make sure that we're keeping companies as well as consumers engaged in this is making sure that both of them can work with each other. I'm a big proponent of what I, I would say the uh, emojis, and I know I've asked the App Association about this, and they were like, would you, well, we're moving, do we move on. Is that the, what are the five things when I go to download an app that I care about? And I always think of the monkeys, you know. Uh, if, you know do, is, it my, is it my contacts? Is it my geolocation? You know, what, what is it that it, I am okay with and I'm permissive with, and what is it that I'm a hard no? For a long time, and still here in the United States, um, I'm not a fan of cookie notices. I feel like it's friction in the system we don't really need. But the cookies here, if you say no, in most American companies, they don't let you into the access to the information. Those of us who travel with Europe, or if you go to European websites, realize that you can say no and still get on the website. Or I don't really know because I haven't downloaded a lot of European apps, but I imagine you can still use functions of the app. So I think that there's a lot of things we need to think about as we continue to find the proper compromise on this. And I think we have had years of healthy discussion, but we need to get to a stage now. I think this particular bill that has been put forward is very much a, a, a you know, we're 90% there, if we can find that last 10%, we should really be working on this. And if we don't get it across the finish line in this Congress, it should be the first thing we do in the next Congress. Okay. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Shane, and thanks, Dan. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Lourdes Terecha, founder of the Rice of Privacy Tech. It's the emerging privacy tech industry hub, so we work with founders, investors, and domain experts to fuel the emerging privacy tech industry. Some of the things that we do are we're really a startup community and less of a think tank or a policy group, so we are on the ground working with founders on uh, funding, on designing technologies that solve our privacy problems. Um, from time to time, we engage on, on policy, policy issues when it relates to privacy tech. For example, we engaged with the White House when they sought comments. They had a working group uh, session in June when it came uh, on the topic of privacy tech and sought comments. And so we provided written recommendations and also attended the meetings for that. But 90% of the time, we're really building and fueling privacy tech companies and the products that they build. Uh, my background is in law. Uh, the past 15 years I've been working in Silicon Valley, working with tech companies on their pri privacy position. I decided to take a step away from compliance and programmatic privacy work and really uh, roll my sleeves up and, and start building because uh, it's an exciting time in privacy tech. There, for the first time, we're seeing uh, investments in, 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 in these startups. So as opposed to just big tech companies adding privacy features, which is also great. I, I think it's also an amazing way to innovate in privacy. We are actually seeing startups that are, are building solutions to privacy problems. So it is quite an exciting time in privacy. Uh, I'm excited to see that some of the proposals that we've been seeing um, touch upon the issue of pets and privacy tech and privacy by design, and that some of the things that those are some of the things that I would love to keep seeing on the ADPPA and flushing out pri the privacy by design provisions there. Um, I do agree with Sarah's comment on how you know the current regime of notice and consent is no longer tenable. We need a better way to move forward. I think one of the ways to do that is to innovate in privacy. We can't keep doing checkbox compliance. We need strong privacy by design, privacy by uh, privacy engineering provisions. We can't uh, we can't bring a knife to a a, a, a gun war, right? Like so, so that's that's kind of what they say in cybersecurity. We many of the attacks, the privacy and security attacks today, are done through AI, and so we can't paperwork our way around that. We need strong privacy technical tools and controls and security controls in place in order to protect consumer privacy. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Thank you, Dan, and thank you to Forum Global for having me here today. I'm Paul Martino. I'm with the National Retail Federation. Uh, we represent the retail industry uh, uh, globally, but also predominantly in the U.S., where it is uh, about one-fifth of the economic output of the country, um, and with $3.9 trillion in sales, and also uh, employs about, or supports about one-fourth of the American workforce, or 52 million Americans. So. Uh, we come at this issue um, trying to look at it more holistically across uh, not just our industry but but the economy, and uh, you know we think it's uh, it's it's a challenging issue. It's one I've been involved with uh, for a couple of decades with uh, Dan and Shane and 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 others. And I know in this room, um, I think uh, probably what I want to uh, point out up front is. Uh, I guess I don't fully subscribe to the idea that notice and choice is 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 um, not workable. In part because consumers want to make choices about things, um, particularly if you think about how they re uh, relate to businesses. And so, um, in my in my comments to um, the FTC on the industry panel last week, I talked about three principles. Uh, the first was that consumers should be free to make informed choices about how their data may be used uh, by businesses, especially if it's going to be used to benefit them. So if they want to choose to participate in a loyalty plan, they ought to be able to do that. Uh, I, I'm concerned when I hear remarks that perhaps the government will decide for you 
uh, what, uh, what you can and cannot choose to do with your data. Uh, retailers also should be able to respond to consumer demand. You know, consumers increasingly want product offerings that they tower uh, to themselves um, that's related to their past shopping activity. Uh, you know, um, when retailers try to make choices for them, consumers don't like that. Uh, on the other hand, consumers should have a choice to opt out and be empowered to opt out of data-driven services. We fully support that, and retailers make those choices available to consumers uh, to really uh, control their communications and, and, and decide how often they want to be bothered, bothered or if bothered at all. Um, you know, we make available things like guest uh, checkout, for example, uh, where you can shop without having an account. But put simply, consumers should be free to make choices. I said last week that the consumers, the customer is always right, and um, uh, we feel that way in, the, in order to respond as a business. Uh, we have to be able to respond to what consumers want. Uh, second, um, along those lines, I made the point last week that businesses should be permitted to use data responsibly and serve the consumers the way they choose to be served. Uh, we're in a highly competitive industry. If we don't use, uh, if we don't meet consumers' demands or, or use data the way they want, uh, they will uh, move on to other businesses. Uh, they are one click away or one one shop away in a mall. Um, and, you know, I think one thing that's instructive here is from the EU is that if you're going to, uh, you know, consider not having a notice and choice model, then you need th something that's in the general data protection regulation, which is a recognition that businesses have a legitimate interest to process data and to serve customers. Um, we know that consumers value hearing from retailers, and the reason is we, we are in the business of trying to build long-term customer relationships. That's why that's a very disciplining factor. It is a market constraint. If we're not building long-term relationships, our, our members won't succeed in the marketplace because, uh, you know, there are very, in the very highly competitive industry, there's also very low profit margins. So. Uh, the only way to compete is to compete on service uh, predominantly. And lastly, the, the point I made last week was that when thinking about the FTC uh, regulations or proposed regulations, if they go down this path, um, we believe they should be customer-centric and, and risk-based, uh, customer-centric in recognizing that there are different relationships that uh, consumers have with businesses when they know who they're uh, shopping with, for example, and they can reasonably expect how the data may be used to, to promote products to them. I think that's with, in line with their, their interest and, and, and consumers are concerned about over-notifying in those instances. Uh, on the other hand, if their data is being collected and used by parties they don't know and they don't know uh, how they may be used and they can't anticipate how that data may be used, I think that is a higher risk scenario for them that the FTC should take into account. So we think the FTC should calibrate its regulations based on the risk and take into account, uh, you know, not disrupt uh, uh, consumer, customer serving businesses where consumers have a lot of choices, they know who they're dealing with and they can expect how their data is being used. On the other hand, not ignore higher risk third party data practices that may leave them in the dark as to how their data is being used. So I th really think the FTC has um, um, an opportunity here to not try to uh, put everyone into a one-size-fits-all model, which is unfortunately what we see on Capitol Hill often. And um, so I do, I do think that there is more work that needs to be done on the ADPPA. In particular, it needs to be uh, more effectively preemptive, and it needs to um, consider alternative enforcement models that won't uh, put a lot of businesses on Main Street at risk of uh, frivolous and, and meritless lawsuits. And so we look forward to working in that process as well. But I'll have more comments on that later. Dan, I'll, I'll wrap it up here with that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Paul. Um, so let's just get right into the, the uh, questions. So what I'd like to ask, because we want to have a kind of a conversation among the panelists too, we're going to start with Ronnie and work our way down the, the, uh, the row. But if, if, if you have a, a, a question, since there's so many of us, if you could just you know, put your little tent TP up and then I can, I can uh, recognize you if you have a question of a, of a fellow panelist. So Ronnie, I want to, want to start with you. Uh, you know, when, I mean, Shane, like, like Shane and Paul you know, mentioned, I mean, we've been working on privacy for 25 years when 
when I started at the FTC, I didn't have gray hair. <laughs> I've worked hard for this gray hair. Um, but even for those of us who have, who have been at this for a long time, this whole, the process, the Magnuson Moss process is theoretical. Um, I mean, there are a few people, a very few people <laughs> around town that have lived through it. But if you could just give us a little primer on, because this, this is important. I mean, I, I know uh, Commissioner Phillips and his dissent, and there are others around town that believe this too, believe that the FTC doesn't have the authority to issue rules. And Commissioner Wilson came at it and said, look, it's his best left to elected officials. But if you could just spend a little bit of time explaining Magnus and Moss and sort of what it is, how it works, and then the other part of it is, you know, the FTC, the, the statute is, is UDAP, Unfair Deceptive Acts or Practices. But that's, with, with Mag Moss, that seems to change to a, to a standard of prevalence. So if you, could, if you could spend a little time after explaining Mag Moss, then to explain what, what prevalent means, because that's going to be really important uh, going forward. Okay, sure. Um, so... Uh, We've been talking about this advance notice of proposal rulemaking, a mag moss um, sort of rulemaking process. And as I talked about, we have this broad statute. And there's an open question about whether our case-by-case -case enforcement is enough. And so as we've been talking about, the FTC is now considering issuing bright line rules involving commercial surveillance and, and lax data security practices. So um, this is something that um, we have to go through a, a very long process to figure out You know what 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 will ultimately come of this, and it is entirely possible that no rule will be issued. Um, so this advanced notice of proposed rulemaking um, is aimed at gathering information through public comments, um, sort of from industry, from consumers, from everyone, about um, a few different things. First, so these are sort of initial determinations we have to make before we can figure out whether a rule is needed. So first, um, we want to hear from the public about all the ways in which consumers or, or you know, commercial surveillance practices, sort of what's out there and what consumers are concerned about. Um, second, we want to know how those um, consumers actually harm, sorry, how those practices actually harm consumers in everyday life. Um, whether those practices are prevalent in the industry. Um, again, this is a determination we need to make based on the public comments we receive. And then when we sort of receive all that information, the next step in the process under a MAGMOS rulemaking authority is to figure out what bright line rules, if any, would address those prevalent nefarious practices in the industry um, that would you know, be a, a sort of a, a textual rule that the industry could follow and that would allow us to, in an instance of a violation, get civil penalties. Um, so that's kind of the background in terms of sort of what this process is. Um, there really is no timeline, so I, we don't know, you know, when this will, if there is ultimately a rule that is issued and comes from it, we have no idea when that could happen. Again, this is going to depend on the public comments that we receive, um, what practices we determine require the most scrutiny, and a, a, host, a number of other sort of, um, sort of factors that I you know, we just don't know what will come of that. Um, and again, there is this pending legislation in Congress, and we don't know whether that will pass or whether that will actually come to fruition. Um, so the FTC is kind of proceeding in the interim under the authority that we do have um, in parallel to this potential legislation in Congress. So this is really an open question as to whether a rule will be issued, what it will say, and sort of when that will happen. Um, so, unfortunately, I can't give you more certainty on that. In terms of whether something is prevalent, again, that's sort of an initial threshold determination we need to make in order to issue those rules. I don't really have a clear answer as to what that would be. You know, there's no 50, you know, there's 50 instances of this, there's a thousand instances of a company doing this. Again, I think this is something that we'll need to sort of take in the public comments and determine mm -hmm. um, what practices we think are prevalent more generally in, in, in the industry and um, you know, which ones require bright line rules that will give companies rules of the role that they can follow and importantly, an ability for us to obtain civil penalties. Um, I did want to mention one thing that um, one of my colleagues brought up about consumer choice and competition. And I think there is an open question about whether consumers actually do have a choice when it comes to companies that they do business with, right? I mean, when you rely on a company to do your homework or to obtain your medication or to get a, a product that you need, and there's really only a host of sort of players in an industry, 
um, you're required to consent to their terms. And I think there's an open question that consumers really do have um, choice and whether there actually is enough competition in the marketplace such that consumers really um, are consenting freely, um, query whether they're doing so because they need to get products and do things that they can't actually do without consenting. So I just wanted to sort of um, mention that as well. Thanks. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, and, and, and thank you for that, that explanation. Um, and understanding that, that, that I think you, use, you said it's entirely possible that, that no rule um, will be issued and it depends upon the, the public comments. That's right. Um, so that's, that's important. But just without a, a, a time frame. Um, but if, if we get, if the commission gets to that point and issues a rule, then can you just quickly sort of walk us through what that step would would look like? Obviously, you, you laid out what has to happen between now and then, and yeah. it might not happen. But just as you know, as we go forward, what would that what would that what would that look like if we get to the the, the notice of proposed rule? Yeah, sure. So if we do actually determine that based on the public comments, mm -hmm. there are things that we want to address. The FTC will come up with the actual text of this proposed rule. It will be issued publicly for public comment. There will be, I think it's a 60 or 90 day period in which the public can um, provide input and comments. The FTC will take that back and consider all the public comments. There could be another round of revisions um, to the proposed rule. Um, then the commission would vote uh, to issue the final rule. Um, I don't know what the exact timeline would be there. Again, that would depend on the public comments that we get. But I think um, it's like 60 or 90 days, a 60 or 90 day period in which the public can comment on the text of the actual rule. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah, oh, actually I see Paul Martino has a question. Oh, I, I really appreciate it. The uh, information, um, that just provided about uh, the rulemaking process. I think that's important, uh, or the, I guess I should say, the, the process that leads to the possibility of a rulemaking um, uh, and the timing that's involved. Um, one thing I just wanted to comment, I thought a great point was made about the interplay of competition uh, and, and choice. Uh, what we support is informed choice. Of course, we're in a highly competitive market where if you don't respond to consumer choices uh, and you don't handle data the way they prefer that you do, you will lose the, that, those customers, you will lose that business. If you don't protect data, if you suffer a breach, there's real harm. Um, I know a lot of talk last week was about uh, you know, uh, consequence-free use of data on the internet. Uh, I think we differ in our industry because it's very transactional. We're, we're, you don't come to a retail website if you're not either looking for a product that you may want to buy or you're buying a product. Um, you're not on the website to, you know, be observed for the sake of being observed, uh, or you know, as you may be on a social media site. I also think that circles back to the competition question. There are, uh, you know, certainly services on the internet and and industry sectors where you you have little choice, um, and and I think uh, Commissioner Slaughter made this point about whether you have an effective uh, choice if you feel the need to be on social media or on a particular platform. Uh, I think we have the benefit in our industry of not having that situation where you feel that you have to be on only one uh, website, uh, that you do have choices in the marketplace. And, uh, and so um, I just wanted to say I appreciate that point. And I, I think it's a very good point about whether or not you have effective choice. But you have to look at the context. You have to look at uh, the types of businesses that are using data and what purposes they're using them for. And if they're using them to serve customers and they're in a highly competitive market where if they don't meet consumers' demands, they will lose business, then that is a very powerful market constraint that's uh, perhaps even more powerful than some regulatory constraints at times. And uh, uh, so I just want to uh, comment on that. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Paul. Shane. So uh, Paul brings up a good point about the idea of doing one generic law around data protection or privacy that I, I, I don't think we've been doing this wrong. I just think that the, we are not currently ahead of where the process is. Healthcare information and banking information absolutely should have a higher bar than a lot of other places. The other thing that we're focusing on, and I think rightfully is on child online protection. I don't have children, but I talked to a lot of people who do, and I was 
fascinated with the fact that when they went to going to online and, and you know, devices were sent home, that they, they quickly migrated from just informational how to have class online to something called edutainment, mm -hmm. where parents were clicking on things and all of a sudden these kids were getting advertised to. And, and I'm not even sure the parents completely understood this at first, that they had somewhere in the terms of use on page 36 or 58, you know, there was something that said you just granted permission for this. And part of that is because of our, the way that the legal structure of our terms of use are right now is we just keep piling on from old law, from old law, from old law, you know, and it's in there somewhere, but we haven't made it easy enough for the average consumer to understand that. So I, I, I think that part of the challenge, and I realize 95 questions seems like a lot, but there are some very good questions that the um, Federal Trade Commission is asking about how do we use the information as consumers? How is the information being collected on us? One of the reasons why I think the Europeans understand this is they have a different risk proposition. They've been through generations where they've seen information used against them as individuals, as families, as you know, groups of society. And we still have this disconnect where people don't understand how information got from A to B. They don't understand the third parties. They don't necessarily understand where the information flows. So it's, it's somewhat on us to make that more clear, but it's clear at every level, including the terms of use and the ability for a consumer to understand where their information flow is going. So I just, you know, I also say a God love Ken Starr, who, um, God rest his soul, who pointed out that everything's in the footnotes that's usually interesting. Um, that, you know, reading the, not only reading the ANPR, but also reading, um, Noah Phillips does a fantastic job of explaining why he sees parts of this that are troubling. But they all have done a very good job, but it's long, and those of us in the room have probably read a lot of it. But how do we get that to the consumer level so they understand how we're trying to protect them and not make it to just another version of this very cumbersome process that we're currently in. Thanks. Thanks, Shane. Lords? Thanks, Dan. I just want to highlight uh, the comments that Ronnie and Paul made when it comes to meaningful consent. Of course, we want consumers to have meaningful choice. Individual choice is a fundamental privacy conceptualization. Um, I think the problem enters when uh, when it comes to how we deploy that, you, we, we truly need for choice and notice and choice to be meaningful and effective. This means no dark patterns. I think this is one area where privacy tech can help. We're seeing early tools being built by technologists and researchers, I believe from Oxford, I'll have to look at my notes, where they built a tool that would um, detect dark patterns in apps. And so this is one area where uh, we, we could deploy privacy tech and innovation and, and look at how notice and choice are being deployed when it comes to apps and other technologies. Can you Thanks. say what dark patterns are? They're manipulative designs that, that uh, manipulate users basically to do something, including, including give choice, so ineffective choice. Okay. Thanks, Lewis. Sarah? Hi. Yeah, I just want to push back against this idea of transparency for consumers. Like, it, there's so many problems with this one, with just the scope of different services you might be using and different places that might be collecting data. Like, think of a smart city. How, how would you even consent to that if you're just, you know, going around DC? It, it would be impossible functionally. The second part is, even if you could do that, we are all professionals in this business, and there are parts of it that I'm sure are very opaque to us. I will be honest here, the ad tech flow of getting from like a publisher to an advertiser and the data flows that are going between it for the different real-time bidding markets, a secondary sources that may go to data brokers, all of that is incredibly complex, and many regulators have talked about how hard it is to map. And then third, as a consumer on the internet, don't you just want things to be, generally speaking, safe and effective? So more information for consumers just seems like, or better information seems like a waste of time. Now getting information to the FTC or state AGs in formats that work for them so that it's easier for them to enforce, I'm all for it. But like that we're gonna terms of service or privacy policy our way out of this problem is just, that's another 20 years of the thing we've been doing and it has not worked. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so as you can see, we're, we, 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 I'll, I'll we do not have a shy and, retire, <laughs> shy and retiring uh, panel, but uh, 
Yeah, oh. I'd, I'd just like to respond respond to that. I, you know, I'm just looking at the notes. I, look, I think you can't have informed uh, choice, as Lord's talked about, if we're not going to provide any more information to consumers. And so uh, I think you have to provide information to consumers that they want. And um, I'm not talking about burying things in privacy policies. I'm talking about letting consumers know, hey, here are your data management controls. Here's what you can control. Uh, when you're on a website, do you want to be? Um, do you want to know about any product offerings? Do you want to know about, um, you know, you know, business uh, partner offerings? If it's joint marketing, um, you know, if you're if you're a member of a of a um, airline loyalty program, you might have discounts uh, available to you at the flower shop, or or more more realistically, uh, you know, rental cars and hotels um, with discounts that they'll provide from business partners. You know, some consumers want those things. Uh, you know, other consumers are very, you know, privacy um, centric and, and want to uh, not have any data shared or receive any benefits. But we can't lose sight of the fact that, that data is used every single day by responsible businesses to serve consumers and provide them better services and more information about how they can um, tailor those those experiences. So uh, we can't throw out the entire economy, uh, you know, with the, with the idea of, of protecting. There's an old, old saying, like, if you want perfect data security, for example, you lock up all the data and it can't move or flow anywhere. Well, then that's not usable at all. So there, there is some balance here, and I think you can't take consumers out of the equation uh, they're the most important part of the equation, of course, uh, and, and using data responsibly, we have to find the right incentives, not just the marketplace incentives, not, not just technology, the right incentives in, in regulations and law as well for businesses, all businesses, to, to use data responsibly. And I think, you know, uh, we ought to think about privacy as, as data management and uh, like other kinds of, of, of resources. And, and of course, consumers, it's, it's their asset. So. They should have a measure of control and, and having informed choice as part of that. Thanks, Paul. Paul, can you spend, because I want to sort of get into this a little more deeply, but can you spend just a minute, because you, you mentioned this in your, your opening too, and you just mentioned the, the, the necessity or the need for right incentives. I think in your opening you mentioned alternative uh, enforcement models, but can you explain or sort of give us some examples of, of what you have in mind, and then we can get to others, but um, related to enforcement models and, and incentives? Um, sure. Uh, this, uh, and this question of incentives came up during the FTC uh, industry panel last week. And so, um, you know, one thing I think is working well, every state privacy law has adopted a notice and cure model. Uh, and I think that there's an important reason for that. The reason we have so much trouble with the idea of going straight to private rights of action and having lawsuits here is that if you look at any of these laws, uh, the state level or the proposed bills in Congress, and, and just do a word search for yourself and count the number of times it uses the word reasonable or reasonably, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's many dozens of times. And so almost everything you're doing in this space, you're trying to do something that is within the reasonable expectations of consumers or handle data in a reasonable way. Um, those are all subjective decisions that a business is making. Uh, compliance becomes very challenging because you're trying to do what you expect the regulators want uh, from, 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 in, you know, from an enforcement standpoint, you want to make sure you're still able to use data and, and, and provide innovative uh, ways of, of serving customers, um, and you don't want that chilled. Uh, so what the notice and cure model did at this, in the state laws, and, and even the California AG's office um, said they had a good experience with it, uh, is that it provides an opportunity and an incentive for businesses and the regulator or the enforcement authority to communicate and to talk about where there are questions or gray areas or gaps or what does reasonable mean. It allows that word I used before, context, to come into the equation and understanding how maybe different industry sectors or different business models have to approach uh, compliance uh, for, that, for that industry. And so, um, you know, I, I think encouraging dialogue and helping businesses get it right is, is the overall, should be the, the, the guiding, 
light for enforcement, um, and, and especially with, with novel laws that will apply across the country to millions of businesses, a uh, country of 330 million or more people, um, we have to be mindful of how many businesses are not here in the Beltway, in D.C., looking at data privacy, you know, legislation and, and, and the politics around it all the time. Uh, they are, for the most part, businesses that want to use data responsibly uh, and, and want to serve customers because that's how they make their business. So I think encouraging dialogue between enforcement authorities and regulators and the businesses they're enforcing is very helpful so that we're not knee-jerk going straight to litigation and a penalistic route. I think that will force businesses to, you know, um, maybe spend more money in their legal department, maybe have less jobs available for, uh, for workers uh, as they redirect resources to defend against potential meritless lawsuits. And so uh, I really hope Congress takes a, a strong look at what the states have done. No state that's passed a privacy law has done so with a private right of action on the privacy provisions. Of course, California has one on the breach provisions. Um, and they all have adopted a notice and cure model of either 30 or 60 days. And I'll end with this. I think it was uh, watching the, uh, the hearings, um, I think it was the markup on the House Energy and Commerce Committee subcommittee where uh, I believe it was Congressman um, Kelly Armstrong who said that the, uh, the California AG reported in their first two years of experience, or maybe it was the first year of experience with the notice and cure, 75% uh, of the businesses they went out to to raise a concern with compliance had cured that concern within 30 days. And I think, again, if, if, the, if the laws are in place to protect consumers and the way consumers are the most protected is by having as many businesses as possible comply with it, then I think there's a place for having this uh, incentive to encourage businesses and regulators and enforcement authorities to, uh, to talk, figure out what the right answer is, figure out what reasonable means in that context before we turn this over to trial lawyers to sue businesses for, you know, um, for practices where I think the vast majority of them have, uh, were well-intentioned in trying to use data responsibly. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Uh, let's have Lourdes and then Ronnie, and I'm sure Sarah wants to weigh in on Right to Cure. Thanks, Dan. On the point about incentives and, and Sarah's comment on, on complexity of ad tech, I'd really love to see more more carrots when it comes to incentivizing privacy protective business models and privacy tech companies. These companies are competing against more privacy invasive business models such as ad tech, which um, to be fair is getting disrupted by privacy tech startups in general. Um, there's a, a flourishing uh, slew of um, privacy tech companies that are building tools in the ad tech ecosystem, so that's, that's good to see. I mean, the same way that we've been incentivizing clean tech, I'd love to see any, you know, the ADPPA or, or any future privacy, uh, federal privacy bill, look at how we could support privacy tech and innovation. Um, there's, there are a ton of things that, that could be used, such as tax breaks, funding, preferential treatment when it comes to government contracting, um, and, and that's just some of the ways that we could take this to the next level, not just do checkbox compliance as we have been doing, um, and, and really do privacy by design and engineering at the tech level. Thanks, Lourdes. Sarah, do you want to weigh um, in? No, I want Ronnie. Oh, oh I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 I just don't want to. No talk. problem. Yeah. So <laughs> as we've been discussing uh, sort of this, the potential for a regulatory regime, I noticed we've been talking a lot about what terms have to be disclosed and what you have to say to consumers on the front end. And I think it is no surprise if you check our website, um, you'll see that in many of our enforcement actions, companies lie. Companies don't tell consumers the truth or just don't really know what's happening with respect to consumers' data, who it's being shared with, and how it's used. So I think it's important, one important part of having a regulatory regime that allows the FTC to enforce bright line rules and to get civil penalties is to give companies an incentive to actually know how they're using data, who they're sharing it with. Um, another thing is, you know, I think Paul talked about um, companies who are honest and try and do the right thing, and I think that's very true. There's also the scenario where companies might integrate third-party technologies, tracking pixels, think about Facebook, 
They have no idea because they haven't done the diligence in terms of what data is being si siphoned off from the app or the website. Again, um, a broader regulatory regime could incentivize companies to not only make clear disclosures and make sure they know what they're doing with their own data, but sort of what they're integrating into their apps and websites and how it's being used by third party companies. I think this is a very big problem in the industry. And um, so again, it's not just about companies lying and deceiving consumers, it's also just not having the appropriate compliance programs in place, not doing sufficient diligence on third party tracking technologies and um, the like. Right, thanks. Sarah, do you want to weigh in on? I, on, I, 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 I just right wanted to, to make a point about loyalty programs. When consumers consent to loyalty programs, they think, like, I'll just take it from Nordstrom because I love Nordstrom. I'm in their loyalty program. That they're just talking to Nordstrom. And it's like, great, yes, please know that I bought, I love this brand because I do and I want to know sales. But loyalty programs are used to funnel data to other people. Like I noticed I, I am a mid 30 year old woman that lives in the DC metro area. I shop at Nordstrom and Taylor and Banana Republic. I have now started getting uh, ads for egg freezing. And I am guessing that part of that, I'm guessing that part of it is they can triangulate my wealth. They can triangulate where I am and know I don't have kids from a variety of purchases, both from like retailers, from my social media use and others, because there's this secondary data economy and these lists are being sold. So again, I appreciate that Nordstrom and I want to have a beneficial relationship. And I do because I like that business, but there is a back end problem of an incentive of either leaking that data through not vetting third party technology or getting like some sort of sell benefit from tracking your customer data and selling it to others to pay for said loyalty program. And that is not obvious to consumers. It's just not. And I think it's disingenuous to say that when you go into a loyalty program, you know that suddenly all of this data and all of these inferences are, are fair game. Uh, yeah, I'd just can, like can, to point out you can, can't. Hey, Paul, can, oh. let's go to, I think, Shane. Oh, can I, just put a, can I respond yeah, to yes. that yeah, but let, uh, point? On the, but can we let, let Shane go first and then let you respond. Let Paul go. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I was just going to say it's hard to draw the implication that the ads you're coming from came from one specific retailer's loyalty program. If you use the web, if you use apps, if you use social media, if you're using a browser, if your telecom company is uh, your, you know, your ISP and it is tracking where you're coming from and selling data, your data is being, uh, you know, handled by many, many parties. Yeah. And so, you know, where your where the ads are coming from, I, I agree with your point that there isn't uh, clear transparency in that, but I don't think it's fair to draw the implication it came from one specific retailer's loyalty program. I will also add on loyalty programs, um, you know, there are many different kinds, as many different kinds of businesses as there are, you know, uh, from airlines to retailers to restaurants. But, uh, you know, your corner store could offer you the fifth cup of coffee free on a punch card uh, you know, where they punch out the holes and when you have all uh, four holes punched, you get your fifth cup of coffee. That's a loyalty program. Loyalty programs, I think, are often confused and, and I think the California law made them, uh, made, uh, created the confusion in the first place by conflating them with financial incentive programs. Uh, loyalty program's purpose is to get you to come back to that same business and do more business with them. Its purpose is not to uh, incite you to join a program so that they can take and sell your data. Um, but most you know, terms of services allow for them to do that if you well, read the privacy policies. That's okay. all I'm saying. But I also don't consumers know. make the choice to opt into these programs. So if you're talking about the highest level of, of consent, I hear your point about informed consent, but if you're talking about the highest level of consent, consumers aren't just you know, subject to loyalty programs, they choose to participate in them. If they don't want to participate in them, if you don't want to participate in the loyalty programs you're participating in, you don't need to. Um, they're a customer choice. And so, uh, again, I, I think, you know, it, it depends on the company. You have to look at, obviously, how they're using data, and you can choose, um, you know, someone that's very concerned about privacy will read the policy and will try to determine where the data is being used and they can choose whether to participate in it or not. But anyway, again, I think uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I, I just uh, feel, felt strongly to talk about the fact that it's hard to, to implicate Got one it. type of service on the web without you know, suggesting that, that, that the ads you find offensive are coming from the same, uh, you know, coming from one, one company. Well, I just think data. we're asking for clarity. I just, we just want some clarity on this. And one thing I was, you know, I, I, 
I'm still trying to figure out how we go from do not call to do not, I want to be do not text, but because all of a sudden now everybody's texting me because <laughs> they can't, I'm not answering the emails because I get so many damn emails, I don't even see them to know that I was, you know, sent something by somebody who I might have signed up for something 15 years ago. Um, but the, but at least on the text, I can just write stop and it goes away theory, it goes away at least for the moment, um, which wasn't even what I was going to talk about, but I just wanted to add that in. Uh, so I think because we do have uh, our European counterparts who are very interested in this conversation, I want to bring their laws into this because I, especially if any of you have done this work, please, I would love to see it. The, you know, the, I mentioned earlier that they have a different risk proposition and, and you brought up the whole idea of, um, you know, they, they've added uh, the cost to the ability to collect data with rules, how, why, who can collect and share data. And, and that's very unclear on our end. GDPR has done their best to try to make that more clear, but it's also added more complexity. And then along with the GDPR rules, which a lot of U.S. companies are following because of the risk of fines. You know, it's money's involved now. But now they've, they have the Data Act and the Digital Markets Act, and I am positive, and I actually had a European tell me this the other day because I was pushing her. Uh, it was, how do I comply with all three? You know, I feel like GDPR is, is, has its certain reason for being, but then I look at the Digital Markets Act and the Data Act, and I feel like now they're trying to recoup coup, almost the same conversation we just had, which is they've realized they've cut off their nose to spite their face on the ability to, uh, to advertise to people that may want their services. So I, I think we have a lot of, um, of you know, things going on here, which gets me back to, Sarah, when you were talking about smart cities, because I love a good smart city. What do you want us to do? I think that's why, like, data minimization and purpose specification are, are good touch points or good FIPS to go back to. I have no problem with a, a store collecting my information to tell me about sales if, if I've opted in or not opted out, whatever. That's very obvious to me as a consumer. And if there's smart city programs, if there's enough like noticed by the government, like smart cities are also difficult because there's a government private partnership interplay that it, that gets into other things, but let's not go down that rabbit hole right now. I think if you have buy-in from the public, you understand the scope of what the data is being used for and that that data cannot leak outwards. Like the smart city, the big obvious harmful button or the scary button is suddenly like a surveillance state, right? Like the police have access and suddenly know where you are at all times and it, it, that's very scary. But if you have a smart city that's being told, oh, we're monitoring this traffic intersection because we're worried about pedestrian safety and this is what's happening and these are the sensors we're using and we to make these changes or whatever it might be. I don't think you then need to get consent from every person that goes through because there has been like a democratic process there it, and then there's a scoping limitation here. I think the harm that comes from this, and I think the Kochavich case is a really good lens into this, is that once you give your data once, it just seems to go everywhere. There is, there is no stopping. So even if you thought it was only for this purpose, this one thing, suddenly it's everywhere. And if we can narrow and contain and make obvious the transaction that's happening, I don't think you need to go down the rabbit hole of consent. Right. Um, Lourdes, let me, because we, we, we want to get to audience questions, um, and I, I, I see you have your, your you want to intervene, but I, I also, I, I want to ask you a question, Lourdes, because uh, something that you said at the beginning about uh, privacy tech and a point that's come up, Shane just made it, about uh, uh, GDPR. And some of us, you know, have been working on GDPR for decades. And I think one of the challenges with GDPR is that when we were, you know, the evolution from the data directive to the regulation, the Europeans were talking about risk management. And, you know, but we never, we never got around with uh, uh, GDPR of sort of in answering the question of the risk to what. And so what we're seeing with GDPR is a lot of, compliance risk pushed way down into the bowels of the of companies it's very expensive but it doesn't get to strategic risk or your you know your expertise is in in privacy tech so I'm I'm wondering I've, I've, I've seen you know we tend to think about privacy and cyber as data risk or business risk and I know, you know, our friend Andy Serwin at DLA has been thinking a lot about strategic business risk, that risk 
is a lot more than just compliance risk or legal risk. There's governance risk, there's resilience risk, there's financial and reputational risk. So what are you, what are you seeing in the, in, in the, in the, in, in the privacy tech space that sort of gets to, because it seems like what companies really need is the understanding of the larger issue of strategic risk. Are you, are you, are you seeing any of that, or are you hopeful that we, we might get there? I mean, we obviously, our policymakers need to keep this in mind, whether it's at the FTC or on the Hill, um, but w what are you seeing you know, out in Silicon Valley? Yeah, great question. Before focusing on the emerging privacy, privacy tech industry, it was really heartening to see tech companies start looking at risks to individuals, risk to their brand, um, and, and, and take a broader approach when it comes to privacy risks. I think there's a wealth of, of uh, information out there when it comes to privacy risks and harms, and I would, you know, I would recommend folks, I would point them really to Solov and Citron who have done a great right. job at, at enumerating those. Um, when it comes to privacy tech companies, we've seen how they've taken advantage of the tech lash that, that has occurred in the past few years when it comes to big tech and really um, capitalized on that and, saw, and, and look, saw the big privacy problems there and said, why don't we solve these instead as opposed to um, creating more privacy problems for, for, for the world? Um, I, I do want to comment briefly on the, you know, you know, it's not fair, the comment you made about how it's not fair to just pinpoint one, one data collector, one loyalty pro program, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't agree more. I think the bigger problem really is surveillance capitalism, as Soshana Zuboff uh, wrote about. Um, we need to look at more and incentivize more privacy protective business models. We need to do more research there. We need to, uh, we need support from any comprehensive federal privacy bill that we may pass to, to really provide incentives, support research funding for, for, for uh, privacy tech and more privacy protective business models. Great. Well, let's, uh, we could obviously go on for hours, but we want to bring you into the conversation. So please, I think there's a microphone. So please raise your hand and identify yourself and uh, ask your question. Rick Lane. <laughs> Hi, Rick Lane, uh, CEO of Iggy Ventures. Um, I have a question for Ronnie and Paul, um, which is, do you think that is critically important for consumers and users of websites to know who is behind those websites so that they have accurate contact information and other information? Is that important to the Federal Trade Commission to know who is behind those websites? Is it important from a retail to say we are who we are versus some other entity that you may not know? Or should websites be able to be anonymous and collect user information and sell products? And Shane, you may want to weigh in this. <laughs> Uh, sure. I mean, uh, as a general matter, yes, I, I think that's important. I mean, it, uh, you know, I, even from, just from an enforcement perspective, being able to go after a company, if there's a violation, we need to know who's behind it. Um, I think this just gets more back to the general concept of people don't know where their data is going. Um, we have situations where websites are doing, companies are integrating third-party technologies, being able to figure out who the first party is, who the third party is, um, I think is important. Um, you know, again, to Sarah's point, data is ending up everywhere. It's ending up in the hands of data brokers. Consumers have no idea how or why. Um, so I think as a general matter, that would be important. Uh, thanks, Rick, for your question. Um, yeah, I think if you're, if you're on a website uh, for a retailer, I think retailers are trying to brand that as much as they can so you know where you are and, and who you're dealing with. I think retailers also make available ways to contact them. Um, you know, with respect to um, how, uh, what was the second part of your question? The, um, I forget the. Uh, it was just about who is behind it for consumer or should yeah. websites be anonymous? Oh, right. Right. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I like your point about anonymous websites. Um, you know, that's that's not the case in our industry. We want you to know who you're shopping with, so you will come back to continue to shop uh, with with that brand. Um, look, but if consumers want to be anonymous, if they don't want to 
uh, have an account just to make a purchase online, you know, equivalent to being able to go into a store somewhere and use cash. Um, the, you know, there, there is guest checkout, a uh, number, of, I think more and more retailers are offering that. Um, but I think, yes, I think it's, it's an important principle about knowing who you're dealing with. And I think in those scenarios where you know who you're dealing with, there's less consumer risk, right? Uh, the FTC talked about this in one of its reports and in, in, during the Obama administration um, with respect to online behavioral advertising. It talked about the fact that if you know who you're dealing with, uh, you can avoid certain kinds of behavior. You have opportunities for redress. Uh, but if you're in a scenario where you don't know who's use, using your data, you don't know, you won't even know uh, how to avoid uh, being able to, to have that data collected, you won't have a redress mechanism. And this kind of comes full circle back to my points before about third parties uh, who you don't know about that may be collecting information. And I think that's one area where the FTC should, should focus to be uh, thinking about the context and, and the differences between the risk presented by those kinds of practices versus those from customer serving businesses, whether it's retail or hotel or restaurant or, or other kinds of businesses that are, that are in highly competitive markets trying to brand themselves, but also trying to use data responsibly so that you will continue to do business with them. Um, I do think one potential failure, since you brought up the GDPR, one potential failure with the GDPR is that uh, I, I think that uh, it didn't spend enough time focused on the data uh, handled by processors. It puts most of its obligations on controllers. We see that model being replicated here in certain laws in the U.S. And it may be having the downside effect of not focusing on the data that, where it's most at risk for consumers uh, and putting too much focus on the first party serving businesses, perhaps because those are you know, easier to spot and identify in the marketplace. So I do think that there is more thought that needs to be put into uh, you know, the kinds of risks consumers face when they don't know uh, who's using the data and how it's, how it's being used. Great. So, can I, so Rick's pointing out something that is actually a legacy issue around the internet, which was they didn't put security gating mechanisms to the on-ramp of the internet, the domain name addressing system, because they had something called the who is. So the who is told you who, you, who, was, who it was, who it connected, really for two main functions, making sure they paid their bill, and then knowing who the technical expert was behind it. And then it became the phone book, for those of you who remember what a phone book is, of, um, <laughs> of the internet. So I, you could find out if some, you know, somebody was doing something bad, you could track them down. There's a lot of criminal activity on the internet, which makes the jobs of a lot of the people here in the room much more challenging and difficult. There is um, there's copyright issues, there's intellectual property rights issues, as well as you know the, the the challenge of the cops trying to find the bad guy who's doing something that's a digital crime. And so the idea of not being able to find that one genesis point, which usually starts at the domain name addressing of the website, is a real challenge. And that's something that the U.S. government has had very strong measures on. And saying that, yes, there is a way to protect your privacy as an individual, and that is a privacy proxy, but just going completely dark because you're worried about the risk of the general, the GDPR, is not an appropriate way to manage the challenges of the internet because we didn't put security on in the beginning because we trusted you would be a good individual. Right. Thanks. We have time for one more question. Hello, my name is Christopher Wood. I'm the executive director and co-founder of LGBT Tech. Um, I think this panel conversation has been really important. I think it highlights some very serious issues, not only on the company side, uh, and, and we've had a lot of bad actors on the company side that have not have harmed uh, individuals from communities like ours, um, as well as many other marginalized communities. But also, from it's important to remember that the federal government has actually used data to harm and go after communities like ours not too long ago. And so I look at, uh, not to mention just the dark parts of the web. Um, so Shane, you keep bringing up the fact that uh, Europe has a long history of and, and uh, of having their data used against them. And I think you're absolutely right. I think we also have, here in the United States have a huge opportunity to look at marginalized communities where their data has been used against them in so many sectors, including sectors where they think their data is protected, like maybe health or financial, but they actually don't fall under those protections. So I think we have, it's more of a comment, but I think we have a lot of work to do. And in the United States in particular, unlike where in GDPR they have some of those core memories from more recent events, 
Um, here in the United States, we have the same opportunities to talk with and involve marginalized communities to make sure that we're seeing some of the pain points for those that suffer the most when the data is misused or not handled correctly. Questions. I was just going to say thank you very much for that comment. I thought that was very thoughtful. I think that is a huge problem, especially in the area where you talked about you know, the LGBT community and we talk about health information. Most people don't know that HIPAA is actually a very narrow statute, does not cover most direct-to-consumer companies, and there is a lot of data that we provide to for-profit, non-HIPAA covered entities about our health, um, you know, our, our pregnancy status, very private things that is ending up in the hands of data brokers. Um, as we talked about the Kachava case we recently announced. So I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. In that area, the FTC, we're trying very hard to do it on a sort of case-by-case -case basis, uh, go after the worst actors. But you know, this may be another reason why we need broader regulatory uh, framework to sort of tackle those kinds of issues. So thank you for that comment. Great. Thanks. Well, we, we've uh, come to the end of our time. We're going to take a break for uh, about 15 minutes and reconvene at 11. But uh, please join me in thanking our panel.